I'd like to thank you all, and in particular the organizing committee, for inviting me to have this opportunity to talk to you tonight about uh, women and the Russian Revolution. This is the centenary year, and uh, it's been a really wonderful time to reflect on many aspects of the revolution. There are great moments in human history where everything seems possible. When it seems possible to rethink how we structure the world, the distribution of wealth and resources, patterns of exploitation and injustice, and even the most basic human relationships. These moments do not come often, but when they come, they bring a new and heady sense of promise and possibility for change. The Russian Revolution in 1917 was one of the greatest of these moments. Perhaps, in fact, the greatest of these moments of the 20th century. The Civil War that followed and the 1920s were a period of enormous ferment and debate. Revolutionaries had ideas about how to change almost everything. There was a very strong utopian strand in those years. And by utopian, I mean the idea that if we can imagine something, we can enact it. That feeling animated people throughout Russia. The floodgates of possibility opened. This great hope and confidence in the future I think is almost impossible for us to imagine today. In fact, we almost seem to be in an opposite moment where the idea that if we can imagine it, we can seize it and enact it seems very, very far off to us. One of the most interesting debates at the time in that period was how do we make the family and how to create the conditions for women's equality within the larger society. So revolutionaries had a vision of women's liberation that basically rested on four principles. The first was the idea of free union, which is also sometimes called free love. The second was women's emancipation through financial or economic independence. The third was the socialization of household labor. And the fourth was the idea that the family as a unit that was governed by the state and by religious authorities would eventually wither away. And I want to just talk a little bit now about these four principles. So the first one, this idea of free union or free love. The idea at the time was that love should be based on mutual attraction and respect. It should be free of economic constraint and dependence. No person should have to stay in a relationship where they were abused or physically harmed or in fact where they just didn't want to be in a relationship with that person anymore. And actually revolutionaries debated the question if there was free union, in other words, if people really were free to engage and to leave as they wished, how long under socialism in a new society would such relationships last? Would they last for a lifetime, as many do today? Would they last for several years? Would they last for a few days? Or maybe they would just last for a few hours. And in fact, at the time, one Soviet sociologist wrote, and this is a direct quote, the duration of marriage will be defined solely by the mutual inclination of the spouses. Yet, in order for this to happen, women 
needed to be independent. People not only needed the legal right to divorce, which they did not have uh, in the Tsarist period, it was almost impossible to receive a divorce uh, in the Tsarist period, but they actually needed the ability to support themselves. So in other words, you can't leave a union if you are financially dependent on your spouse. And in 1917, in this period that we're talking about, neither working class women nor peasant women had the ability to support themselves independently and to be economically autonomous of men. So this was a very, very important thing. Free union meant that women had to have access to a decent and independent wage. It was also seen at the time that participation in the labor force would be a good thing. It would bring women out of the kitchen, it would introduce them to the wider world, it would bring them into a work collective where they would deal with issues within the public sphere. So it would also widen the world for women. It would open up all kinds of possibilities for them. The third aspect, the socialization of housework or household labor. So. Here, the idea was that labor that is performed by women within the home for free, and I think we all know what that labor is. It's cleaning, cooking, doing laundry, care of children, care of the sick, care of the elderly. All of these tasks, which are performed largely by women within the home for no remuneration, in other words, for no wage. Those tasks would be transferred into the public sphere to be done by people for good wages. So for example, people would be able to eat in neighborhood dining halls. They would be able to use laundries and daycare centers and various forms would be created so that the work that was previously done by women within the family would now be socialized and transferred into the public sphere. And then finally, the last idea. This was that if you had these three conditions met, free union, socialization of household labor, and financial independence for both spouses, that the family form would begin to change. And the idea here was a Marxist idea. It was that if we look back in human history, far, far back, we see that the family form changes over hundreds, even thousands of years. So for example, the tribal family form differs from the family form of, let's say, peasants under feudal society which differs from the family form of primarily waged people under capitalism. And the idea here was that under socialism too, the family would change. In other words, the family was mutable. And in the minds of the revolutionaries, the family, as we now know it, would wither away. Otmirat was the word, to slowly wither away. Basically, people would come together or separate as they wished. Children would be supported and cared for by their parents and by the state, regardless of whether they were born within a marriage or outside of a marriage. In fact, the very idea of an illegitimate child would cease to exist. It would lose all legal force. All children would be legitimate, welcomed, loved, and this as a juridical or legal category would no longer exist in any way. The very concept of illegitimacy would cease. Now these ideas that revolutionaries had about the family were also closely related to revolutionary ideas about law. In fact, many revolutionaries at the time believed that within a short period 
the family, the state, and the law would all wither away. Society would have rules, it would have procedures, but it would not have law as we know it today. Civil law, for example, would be completely changed. And you can also imagine in a situation where there was full employment and people were, uh, had access to decent wages and to um, uh, democratic forms of economy and government, that in fact criminal law also would change completely. So there was this hopeful sense at the time. And I just want to read you another quote. This was by the young jurist who helped draft the very first family code. And he wrote at the time, quote, of course, in publishing these law codes, proletarian power does not want to rely on them for very long. Proletarian power constructs its laws dialectically so that every day of their existence undermines the need for their existence. In other words, law as a body would help to move people along to that point in time where law became completely unnecessary. It's a very interesting idea, I think, if you think about it. Now I want to point out one thing to you. Unlike contemporary feminism, the Bolsheviks had a very different idea about household labor. So contemporary feminists actually have struggled very hard within the family to divide household labor, to make sure that both partners do roughly 50%. And that, I would say, has been the struggle since the 1970s. It's a struggle I think we've all been involved with in one way or another. Uh, for those of us who are older, we've seen a lot of changes. And for those of you who are somewhat younger, you may have seen changes in terms of how your parents apportion uh, work within the home. And that's been a kind of struggle of contemporary feminism. That struggle was actually recognized in Cuba recently where uh, it was actually enshrined in law that men must do 50% of the housework. Now, what happens if you fellows violate that? I don't know. But it turns out that Cuban women now do have recourse to, I guess, call the police and say, he's not doing the dishes, or he hasn't done the laundry. Um, so this is actually now, this program has been brought into law in Cuba. The idea of socializing housework is also different from a group that was very active in the 1970s. And that group was called Wages for Housework and it existed in the United States, it existed in Italy and in France, and it may have even existed here too. What that group said is that women's household labor, everything that women do within the home, is absolutely critical to maintaining the economic system. In other words, if women stopped doing that work, everything would fall apart. So, women should be paid a wage by either employers or the state in recognition of the value of this work. So that was the idea now of paying women in the home to do household labor. So again, the Bolsheviks, neither of those two ideas. Their idea was just take it all and socialize it and pay for it uh, within the social sphere. Okay. So the group that was most committed to this vision was a group that was called the Genotiel, which was the women's department of the Communist Party. The Genotiel was actually the very first mass-based organization created by women. It was mostly created by working class women. And some of its initial founders were textile workers, daughters of laundresses, these were women that had gone to work at a very, very early age. Some of them had entered the factories at the age of nine or 10. And they were enormously committed to this vision of women's liberation. So it was the first mass-based organization 
created by women to advance their own interests in a revolutionary context. Now we know that women organized in the French Revolution as well, but they organized on behalf of their class, not on behalf of their sex. So the Jeanne Dale is really a first, a historic first. And the Russian Revolution was again the very first to include women and their interests as an integral part of the revolutionary movement. One thing to remember is that it was created in response to strong pressure from women party members. And its purpose was to remake buit, or daily life. So that's a phrase, a Russian phrase, a word, buit, which means daily life. The creation of a separate organization within the Communist Party of women, for women, did not come easily. In fact, many party members, male and female, did not think that women should have their own organization. They thought that women should just be part of either the party or the unions or other mass-based organizations, but that they should not be within a separate organization. And at the lower levels of the Communist Party in particular, there was a lot of male hostility to the Jeanne Dieu. There was the feeling that these things were not important, that daily life was something that was um, something we didn't want to be bothered with. Uh, why did we have to talk about these issues? So I would say, even among Communist Party members, the thing that we need to realize is that it was women within the party that had to press and to fight to create this organization. So nothing ever gets handed to you. I think in general, you've got to fight. That's one of the lessons I learned from studying the Jeanne Note Dieu. What did it do? Well, it had a dual structure. First, it had something called delegate assemblies, where it organized women workers and peasants throughout the entire country. Many of these people were illiterate, they had very little education, and these were the first big political meetings they had ever gone to. Those delegate assemblies then democratically elected representatives <coughs> from the Jeanne Dieu, who then were placed in government at the very highest level to sit in on meetings to learn how government was run. Now imagine that today. Imagine placing women from working class backgrounds and jobs in every corporation, every organization, and at the highest levels of government. So they were there for two reasons. One was to learn how to govern, but the second was also to keep the leaders honest and to make sure that their interests and their concerns as working class peasant women were at the forefront of the new state. The second part of this dual structure was something called the Women's Commissions. And what they did was they functioned on the local level, in rural areas, in provincial towns, all over the country, to basically fight for women's issues. So they were very active in combating unemployment. They were active in terms of combating prostitution, to providing education for women, and also to trying to create the basis to socialize household labor. So dining halls, daycare centers, laundries, they were very involved with this whole social program. In the 1920s, I should say, the Jeanne Dieu faced enormous obstacles. First of all, this was a period of mass unemployment. People had returned from the Civil War, and men had taken their old jobs back, and in many cases, women were uh, replaced. So it was a period of high unemployment, in fact, for many people, but in particular for women. Unemployment was quite high. 
It was also a period in which the state, this new first fledgling socialist state, was trying to rebuild what was in fact a completely ruined economy. The economy had been destroyed by years of World War I and then by the fighting of the Civil War and then in 1921 by a terrible famine that followed. So there were many, many things that had to be restored, the railroads, industry, and the state at that time did not have much money to invest in social services. So this also was a huge and serious problem. And I should say last of all, in addition, a big problem was something known as proletarian anti-feminism, but there were many men, working class and peasant men, who may have supported the goals of the revolution, but could not see themselves coming around to support women's emancipation. So that also was a, an ongoing issue, I think, on the local level. Okay, so let's return now to the top of government just for a little while. So within less than a year, that's by 1918, the new socialist government had introduced a family code that put this revolutionary vision into law. The 1918 family code swept away centuries of patriarchal and church power. It was in fact the most progressive legislation that the world had ever seen. First, it abolished illegitimacy and entitled all children to parental support regardless of whether they were born within or outside of a registered marriage. Second, it created equality, full equality for women under the law. Third, it established, it established civil marriage in place of religious marriage. So up until this point, it was religious authorities, uh, Russian Orthodox, Jewish, Muslim, that basically governed all marriage and divorce. Now a new set of civil laws were enacted and civil marriage became the only marriage that held legal force. You could still get married in church if you wanted to. You could still have a rabbi or a mullah bless you, but you needed to register the union in civil marriage if you wanted it to have legal force. The code also established divorce at the request of either spouse. No grounds were necessary. If either spouse felt they wanted a divorce, they didn't have to explain why. They simply went to court and petitioned for a divorce. At that time, that freedom did not exist anywhere in the world. It established an equal right to alimony for both men and women. And then in 1920, the Soviet Union became the first country in the world to legalize abortion, to make abortion free, legal, and performed in hospitals and clinics by doctors. And again, this was an enormous first. In 1927, after very intense debate, uh, kind of raged throughout the entire country, Everybody got involved in it. Workers, peasants, students, it was a very, very serious topic of conversation and was discussed everywhere. The code became even more radical. First, it recognized living together, just living together, or cohabitation, as the legal equal of registered marriage. So think about that for a minute. If just living together is the same as entering a civil union, why bother to register the marriage? Living together has the same rights as civil marriage. And think back to that quote that I read you from Goichbarg about moving the population along. So you see right away, you can see how it's being done. If you legally grant the same juridical rights Two, cohabitation as to registered marriage. Why register? And you can see in a way how this is sort of moving people along in that direction. 
And then the second thing that it did was it made the divorce procedure even simpler. You no longer needed to go to court at all. In fact, all you needed to do, either spouse, was just pop into a registry office, like a post office, fill out a form, and you were divorced. If your spouse wasn't with you, they would be informed of the divorce by postcard. <laughs> so you imagine, you know, you have a fight <laughs> with your husband in the morning, and the next thing you know, you've got a postcard in the afternoon. It's over. This became known as the famous Soviet postcard divorce. Okay, so you see, this is quite a revolutionary program. Well, all of this legislation began to produce some serious social problems. And in fact, you may be able to guess what some of these might have been. First of all, there were problems with divorce. The law was often used by men to repeatedly marry and divorce multiple women, often leaving each one with a child. Alimony was very, very difficult to get because women would try to get alimony or child support through the courts and men often left town or they changed jobs or they had a variety of ways of not paying uh, for alimony. As I mentioned to you before, the 1920s was a period of very high unemployment, particularly for women. So if a woman was married, divorced, and left with a child, and she couldn't find work, she was in serious trouble. And often, women had the support of children. They frequently had the support of elderly parents. And many working class women who could not support their families or had been abandoned by men found themselves walking the streets. In other words, they became prostitutes. Now clearly, this was not why the revolution had been fought. And this was a serious problem at the time. The courts were absolutely overwhelmed by alimony cases. So it actually became a court problem as well. Uh, the judges were just simply overwhelmed by the sheer number of cases on the docket. Second, even if a woman had a job and she could support her children if she was abandoned, the socialization of household labor that we talked about the creation of laundries, dining halls, daycare centers, all of these things cost money. And the state at that time was quite impoverished and did not have the money to put in to these social institutions. So the question of where to leave children when uh, you had a job and you had children and there wasn't anyone to look after them, that was a serious question. So in other words, what we have here is we've got free love, but what we don't have are many of the things that are necessary to really support it in a way that makes sense. Peasants also had a tremendous amount of trouble with the new law. So peasants lived at that time within a multi-generational, patrilocal household. What that meant was that when a girl married, and most girls got married probably by the age of 15, 16 in the countryside, if you reached the age of 20 and you were not married, you were considered an old maid. Um, so when a girl married, she went to live with the family of her husband. And this was a multi-generational family that was ruled by the oldest male member, known as the bull shock. He had control not only over all of the women in the family and the children, he also had control over his own sons. So we're talking here about a, a very strong patriarchal structure. The peasant household was large, and you can imagine, at that time, peasant women also often had 15 children. Uh, they began childbearing as soon as they got married. 
and there was no birth control, and they continued bearing children until menopause. So they had a child roughly every two years, sometimes every 18 months, and this was life. Um, so imagine within a household, if you have, let's say, um, the older couple had eight sons. Each of the eight sons takes a wife. Uh, we've already got 18 people in the family. And then they themselves now begin having children, okay? So these were large families. The family was a unit of production. In other words, they worked the land together. They owned the farm animals in common. They owned all the implements, the hut. They held everything in common. And children, male children, were vested in the household through the male line. So if a woman in this situation got divorced, and what's remarkable actually is that many peasant women did avail themselves of divorce. They were beaten, they were oppressed, they wanted out of those marriages, but they had to leave their children and they had no way to live in the village. You could not live in the village as a single person. You had to live within a household. So here now the peasants have this enormous freedom for divorce and peasant women do take advantage of it. But how can they then go on to live? There was no way the peasant family could pay alimony. In general, peasants were not part of a waged economy. And they had, if they were going to pay the woman to live separately, whatever they paid her would have to be taken not from her former husband, who had nothing other than the property that was owned in common with the household. It would have to be taken from the household as a whole. So you can see now some of the problems that were involved in Russia. Soviet Union at this time was overwhelmingly rural. The vast majority of people were peasants. So we have this very advanced law, and yet when we look at economic or social relations, they are not that different than how they were 300 years before. And that also was a major problem. And finally, I'd just like to talk one more thing about abortion. So, when abortion was made legal, the um, uh, doctors, the jurists, the social hygienists, all of the people that weighed in on these debates, they had the idea that if good material conditions were created, in other words, all the things that we talked about, women would not have any reason to avail themselves of abortion. They would simply want to have children because, after all, children would be supported and cared for. Women had a very different idea about abortion. And I'm talking now about all women. I'm talking about peasant women, working class women, students, intellectuals, educated, uneducated, married, unmarried, mothers of many children, women that didn't yet have children, okay? Across the board, their idea was, no matter what the material conditions, they wanted to be able to have access to abortion so that they could control their fertility and control their lives. At a very basic level, women understood that if you can't control your fertility, if you start bearing children at 15, and you have a child every 18 months or every two years, in other words, when you stop nursing and you become fertile again, um, your life is not your own. You can't study, you can't go to school, you can't take a job, you're just prey to this. And so women felt very strongly, and they expressed this feeling that abortion was necessary if they were going to avail themselves of other opportunities. So right off the bat, we've got a little bit of a disconnect, okay? Okay, in 1930, after a very sharp set of struggles with the left opposition and the right opposition, 
uh, within the party, Stalin emerges as the foremost leader in power. And we can talk a little bit about this, but let's just say it's a very complicated set of issues. Stalin assumes at this point unchallenged leadership within the party, and he moves forward with a program that's based on rapid industrialization and collectivization of the peasantry. Women enter the wage labor force in record numbers. In no other country of the world do women enter the labor force so quickly or in such large numbers as they do in the Soviet Union. And actually by October of 1930, there is no more unemployment in the Soviet Union. None. If anything, they've now gone from unemployment to a severe labor shortage. So we have these huge changes. And the party now launches a new slogan. That slogan is, face to production. And what that means is that every area of life should now be subordinated to production. Whether it's production of food on the collective farms, whether it's production of heavy industry within the factories, whether it's the opening up of mines, in every single area of life, this is the key and the most important thing of all, face to production. In 1930, the party abolishes the Jeanne Diao. It's done. The women's organization is dissolved. The ostensible reason is that the Jeanne Diao is unnecessary at this time when we are all facing toward production. And the women's activists, who are also known as the Buitoviki, or the people that were the most devoted to daily life and its transformation, they are told now, <coughs> organize, but we're not organizing on behalf of women. Organize in the collective farms, organize in the factories, organize in the unions, but we're not organizing on behalf of women anymore. It's not necessary. So the Jeanne Nautiel is abolished in 1930. At the time, there is now also the beginning of a strong ideological change or shift in the state's approach to the family. Judges, educators, jurists, the militia had all become increasingly concerned about the large numbers of homeless children on the streets. There are all kinds of issues with juvenile crime. And the state now begins searching for different, more repressive, punitive solutions to social problems. Social problems are no longer considered the result of poverty. They're now considered the result of irresponsibility. And the state now begins to resurrect the family as an important <coughs> institution for creating stability. Divorce becomes much more difficult to get. Abortion is outlawed. And there is a huge campaign to find men who are not paying alimony, to force them to pay, and also to resurrect this idea now of something they call a strong socialist family. So we can see there's a huge turn by 1936 in the entire approach to the early revolutionary vision. Some aspects of that vision are retained. So women do move into the workforce in record numbers. Unemployment is eliminated. Women gain financial independence. And the state does create daycare centers, socialized dining, some laundries. And I would say that those institutions really do restructure Soviet life in many ways. So for example, most families actually began eating their main meal uh, either at work or at school and then frequently came home and would fix a much simpler meal for the evening. Um, in other words, people take advantage of these things that are created for them. 
At the same time, though, women still carry the main burden for most household tasks. So there is no question anymore about equalizing. That had never really been part of the revolutionary vision. And women now assume, Soviet women assume, what we call in the West the double burden. In other words, they worked, they took care of the children, and they also took on most of the household tasks. I'd like to just end now with a few thoughts about the double burden and household labor and what this legacy of the revolutionary vision might mean for us today. Under capitalism, and we live under capitalism, women still assume the burden of household labor or they pay other women to assume that burden. In other words, they pay poorer women to come in and clean uh, and do the things that women who are now in the public sphere, who work for wages, do. Okay? So, basically, we have a situation under capitalism in which who performs household labor? It's performed by immigrants, it's performed by very low-paid workers, and they either do it for private families, or they do it in the public sphere, for example, in elder care homes, in daycare centers, generally if we look in any university, who does the cleaning, who does the serving, uh, we can see again an enormous use of immigrant female labor doing those roles. So in a sense, household labor has been socialized. In other words, it's been transferred into the public sphere for a wage, a very low wage, barely a living wage, I would say. But it's been socialized only for the wealthy. So the vision that we have of freeing women to enter the wage labor force is now one that actually the wealthy can take advantage of. Poorer women don't take advantage of that. And the second thing that I think is really important, and this is in reference to globalization, millions of men and women now, we know, are forced to cross borders by economic necessity to leave their own countries, women often leaving their own children behind in order to find work in other countries where they perform this low-skilled household labor either within private families or within public and private institutions. So for example, who cleans the hotels in Moscow? Women from Kyrgyzstan. Who does this work in Qatar and Saudi Arabia? People from Pakistan and India. In the United States, who does this work? Women from the Philippines, from Latin America, and the Caribbean. Not only now do women have to do this work now for other families and for social institutions, but they have to cross borders to do it. So what we see is the same problem that the Bolsheviks looked at a hundred years ago. It's the same problem, only now it's even worse. Because in a sense, people are now forced to leave their own families thousands of miles away in other parts of the world to perform this labor. And I would say now the problem of household labor, if we really want to think about it, has now assumed a global form under capitalism. We still have the problem, but it has assumed a global form. And I think the question that is facing us today, and it's a question I'm going to just throw out to all of you, and I'm interested in your ideas about this, is how can the double burden be eliminated, not just for a small elite 
but in fact for all women.